All right, everybody. Uh, we're going to bring it home with the best session of the uh, conference. So, Anna, please take it away. All right, thank you. And thank you for staying until the end. So, uh, my name is Ana Jimenez. I'm a OSPO project manager at Tutu Group, that is the OSPO community of practice at the Linux Foundation. And I'm glad I'm honored to moderate today's panel on an introduction to open source program offices. Uh, so we were discussing a bit uh, on how to start this. And uh, we, we, we agreed that the best uh, way to do this first b before addressing OSPOS is uh, giving a wide overview, a really uh, quick overview on the value of open source nowadays. So I, I just wanted to share a few intros, right, on, on, on where are we now. Uh, open source is everywhere. And when I say everywhere is you might be using um, software that might be proprietary or not, but in at the background, there are already open source components. And that is uh, the critical part of that. According to the latest research uh, from uh, uh, from Synopsis that is, there have been doing this uh, study for the past four or five years, uh, we have found in, in this year that 93, 96% of uh, the code bases, I think they uh, did an analysis on more than 1,000 code bases from different sectors around the world, uh, contains open source. And also, uh, a quite alarming fact is that 84% of those code bases contain at least one open source vulnerability. So um, right now, by looking at the software supply chain of uh, how software is developing and how, where the modern applications stands, we're seeing that um, these components have several touch points uh, with potential security vulnerabilities, and all those touch points contains open source. And I know that in this um, conference, we already saw these popular images. I think, in fact, in the last, <laughs> uh, I think we, we are keeping repeating and repeating. But I, I, I like this because it's kind of visual to see wh where are we. So everything is standing on open source community. I'm not saying even projects. Projects are maintained by a community of people. And uh, it's a different world. It's a different ecosystem. And there's a point where organizations need to know how to interact there and how can they better help and uh, sustain uh, this infrastructure and their community that is supporting them. So the OSPO is, in general terms, this links being between the organization and the open source ecosystem. And there are already out of the internet a few definitions. Uh, one is from Wikipedia that I'm going to read it. Like in Wikipedia, they say that it's a department concerned with free and open source software, open standards, and cares. Uh, from one of the OSPO communities uh, that I'm involved, the Tutor Group, it's defined as a center of competency for organizations, open source operations, and a structure. OK, we kind of get that. That is kind of general. Uh, and for that, I'm here also to see specifically how each of the different OSPOs that we have here sees uh, the, the, the OSPO setup, and uh, we can navigate through the challenges and specific uh, areas of focus that uh, panelists are here are, are right now um, involved in. So uh, saying that, I think we can start with some introductions. Uh, we can start with uh, Boris. If yes, yeah. it would be a pleasure. Um, I'm Boris. Uh, I come from France. I work at the uh, French transmission system utility, which is called RT for Réseau d'électricité. Uh, I'm a computer scientist and uh, I'm uh, working in the uh, R&D department. I'm in charge of the open 
R&D roadmap. So open R&D means we open our uh, R&D work inside the company, of course, but of course at a worldwide scale. So a lot of partnership things and of course an OSPO and I am the director of this OSPO. And uh, also I work on the strategy for sustainable IT in order to try to manage uh, the impact of the limit of the planet on the IT for long term. Remy? Hi there, everybody. Uh, thank you for being here. I know we're the last session of the day, so really appreciate everyone. Uh, my name is Remy DeCosmaker, and I am the open source lead at the digital service at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, which is part of the Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, we have a group that takes product, engineering, design, policy, and contracting experts and sends them to work alongside of civil servants on a tour of duty to help solve some of the most complex problems facing healthcare today. Uh, we follow the playbook.cio.gov uh, playbook, which is all about agile development, product management, and the last play in the playbook is open source. So uh, defaulting to open, uh, that's what our team specializes in. So uh, we help to establish the first open source program office at a federal agency in the United States. Uh, it is an exciting place to be and uh, really excited to talk more about growing the program and how about we go about doing that. And I'll pass it to the next panelist. Hi, I'm Saith Choudhury. I'm the director of the Open Source Programs Office at Carnegie Mellon University. And uh, I, I'm also the Associate Dean for Digital Infrastructure, which is a role that connects to the Open Science Program at, at Carnegie Mellon as well. And uh, I'm hoping to give you some sense of while a lot of the things that you hear about the other OSPOs are common to universities, there are some very particular and unique aspects of a university's culture, its mission, the roles within the institution, uh, the level of autonomy and freedom. If you heard uh, Olga's presentation just in the last session, she talked about the creative expression and freedom of expression around open source software. That is enormously important in a university context. Uh, if you're a fan of Spinal Tap, it goes to 11 uh, in, in that context. Uh, but also the nature of the projects and the number of contributors. So uh, there's someone who I deeply respect in the private sector, uh, Open Source Forum, Dwayne O'Brien, who I've been working with for about three years, I guess, at this point. And he's, as he's learned more about universities, he said something very interesting to me recently that, you know, in the private sector, we think of it as a continuum. Right, we have these few large projects with many contributors and there's this continuum of contributions and community building and engagement and so on. It seems like in universities, you have a lot of milestones. You have many more projects with fewer contributors and there's sort of this continuous cycle of having to build up the capacity across all of them in a way that may or may not be similar to the other, other contexts. So hoping to dive into that a little bit more. Uh, hi, I'm Jordan Casper. Uh, I'm a senior technical advisor in the Department of Homeland Security, so uh, same department as your previous speaker, Olga. Um, and uh, I am the only person here that is not part of an open source program office. I'm mostly here, I think, because I'm the person that <laughs> asked to have this panel. Um, however, uh, in addition to being a senior technical advisor, um, I'm a software engineer by trade and I've been contributing to open source for over 20 years now. Um, I also helped write the open source policies at DOD the current signed policy at DOD and the current signed policy at the Department of Homeland Security. Um, and while I don't officially have open source in my title in any way, as Olga mentioned in the last talk, that's mostly because setting up a program office in the federal government is extraordinarily difficult. Um, hopefully we will be the second open source program office in the federal government soon. Right, Olga? Soon? <laughs> yeah, plus, plus minus a few days. Um. Thank you. So I think my first question uh, to the panelists, given the fact that we, we got a, a quite diverse group, right? Like academia, public sector. So my first question is, what are the responsibilities of, uh, of, of an OSPO uh, when guiding policy uh, development and decision making for your respective uh, sectors? You want me to jump in? All right. I think to be brief is, um, to create a confident relationship with our stakeholders. And by stakeholders here in your question, I mean uh, particularly speaking about regulation. So 
I take a metaphor of uh, the water. Um, yesterday, we used the metaphor of the mountain. Um, if you have a, a, a one-month baby and, and you put him into the water, everything will go okay for him. He will be in contemplation. Uh, and if you do that each month, maybe he will become a professional swimmer ready for Olympic Games. Not Paris, because it's too late, but for the next. And uh, by that, what I mean is, with this confident relationship, uh, the OSPO community can have with the regulation, we can make them used to think about open source. And when they have this kind of reflex, they become some kinds of professional of taking all the benefits open source has to offer to their mission. And concerning the energy, we can go back to the mountain metaphor, uh, we are all uh, going to the north face for this energy transition. And open source has a lot to offer and maybe for securing this way. So I see the open source as a rope and I see the OSPO as a carabiner. So you can, we can, and the regulators can maybe uh, give uh, huge advice to all the energy sector by saying, okay, we go to the North Face, so don't go one by one. Please go in a rope team. So I think that the action of the OSPO from a utility perspective to the regulation is to build this kind of uh, way of thinking together and stopping, and Alex uh, said that at the first session, stopping to make new things. Now it's time to build together. And the open source is, I think, the, the best way to do that. And we have 30 years of experience. And it's not... S it's almost an axiom. It's one plus one, I think it's equal to. It was challenges today, but that's it. One plus one equal two. So we can maybe uh, promote what happens during the last 30 years about open source for network telecommunication, for now vehicles, and of course for cloud. Cloud, cloud uh, domain is a, a very nice demonstration. How powerful is it to, 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 go, to go on? Any other comments? Yeah, I'll, I'll add that uh, one of the roles, I think, for a university-based OSCBO is to be the interface between the institution's policy and the broader policy landscape, right? Um, so Carnegie Mellon is probably at one end of the spectrum in that we literally don't make any IP claims on faculty and student open source that's being produced. But even at other universities, what they might say is, please let us know that you're working on open source, or if you're going to tech transfer, technology transfer, have a disclosure, uh, or, or so on. But it's still not a very strong claim on, on the creative expression that, that's done through the research process of a university. Uh, but if you think about, for example, there's a project that is relevant to, to this, this setting. So I'm, I'm not an energy modeler or an energy expert in any way, so I might not do this particularly well, but there's a project called the Open Energy Outlook, which is an optimization model looking at decarbonization for lots of different aspects of technology and you know, natural resources, availability, and so on. And it gives you the minimum life cycle cost for you know, an energy system across the US. So this group has said you know, that we'd like to work with the Department of Energy uh, in some way to, to propagate this model out, out outside of CMU. And that's when I start to say things like, well, okay, are you aware of the public access memos that have come out of the Office of Science and Technology Policy? Or that the White House has declared last year as the beginning of the year of open science? Or that there are security issues that you should be thinking about uh, that we heard about the last session? So faculty don't typically think about any of that when they start a project. And at some point, preferably as, as far upstream as possible, we'd like them to think about it. So the OSPO is starting to play that role of just because the institutional policy may not ask you to think about these things. If you want to engage outside of it with the federal government or even the private sector, you need to think about policy more broadly. Um, I, I really liked, Boris, this, your analogy. I can't see you because you're like right behind Remy. But uh, the analogy is really um, apt uh, of, of providing the confidence, providing the support structure. Um, uh, I will take a completely different perspective, although I think that is important and an OSPO should do that. Um, within the US federal government, the OSPO has another role, uh, which is, how do I say this nicely? Um, we don't do things well 
a lot of the time. And uh, I apologize if there's any federal contractors in the room, but it's mostly because federal contractors will just try to make money and the US government doesn't hire technical people to say, no, that's a bad idea. Uh, and one of the ways that they don't do things well is how they manage open source uh, software within a project. Um, so it's not that we have people that want to do it and aren't confident and don't know how, it's that they are explicitly not doing it. And we, uh, US government, OSPO, need to tell them to do it. And part of that is not just uh, using an open source project inside of custom developed source code or publishing code that we uh, produce as open source, but it's also looking at open source options during our analysis of alternatives during the acquisition process. And so I think in the US federal government, there's another angle here that is really, really important that academia probably doesn't have as much, which is federal acquisitions and how do we make uh, uh, acquisition professionals, contracting officers, look at open source alternatives um, before they ever get to, we're going to custom build something that is almost certainly gonna have hordes of vulnerabilities. Yeah, and thanks to, you know, we all stand on the shoulders of giants in open source, as they say. Uh, thanks to, you know, we have about 20 years or so of federal open source policy, going back to maybe 1999, when the DOD first started putting out their first memo. So uh, my job, to answer your question, is a lot easier than if you would have asked me five or 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, there is regulations, there are executive orders, there's legislation, there's a really clear authority that open source is a part of what we do in the federal government. And the way that we view our role in that at the OSPO at CMS is uh, there's regulatory guidance, and then there's sub-regulatory guidance, and then there's guidance, right? So there's lots of policy. We do have, uh, we do help with policy. There's a a group called the Open Source Software Security Initiative that brings together folks uh, convened by the Office of the National Cyber Director. There's some members here today, shout out Olga and the folks at CISA for convening that. Uh, so that's one piece of it, but programs that help to manage the risks as well as the opportunities of open source and then projects themselves. So uh, we think about it from you know raising the floor or the digital standard of living for all of the open source projects across the ecosystem and then we think about raising the ceiling for the project specifically when they need to have goals that they want to meet. So we're coming at it both from a, a bottom-up perspective of like how do we support the developers, the contractors, the community members, the volunteers, how do we show, right? We can tell and the policy says thou shalt or thou shalt not, but in the OSPO it's a lot of demonstration and it's a lot of reference implementation and it's in a lot of how do we walk the talk. And it's really exciting because we don't always need million dollar wizard contractors or you know, the highest end uh, folks to do it. You know, we just need enthusiastic, motivated, passionate folks who want to help solve some of the hardest problems facing the supply chain. So you know, we help hackers work together and contributors work together to use their powers for good. And uh, the OSPO is a, a great bridge, like you said, to doing that and it's a, you know, when we can demonstrate that work and how to do it, that's when other agencies can learn from each other and we can all share because we all, all boats rise with the tide. Good. Uh, so when I hear OSPO challenges on the high level, I kind of see like a, some common trend, but I would like to hear here uh, the, any op specific operational challenges that you're facing in your OSPO that you feel like, well, this is kind of different from what I've seen in other OSPOs, and this is really specific and special in, in my OSPO. Are there any use cases, any um, thoughts? <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll just reiterate what Olga said again and what I said earlier. Standing up a program office in the US federal government is really difficult. And I will actually say that one of the things that we are doing is that um, CISA did not stand up an open source program office to start. We just hired someone whose casual title is open, soft, open source security lead. We didn't create a program office. You, that's really hard. So a lot of times it's it's that is one of the biggest challenges because we have to align that to uh, uh, presidential budget and uh, congressional appropriations. We have to align that to IT strategy and secretary's goals in the case of DHS and, and things like that. So it's it's an extreme challenge. Um, and then the second thing that I'll mention, and uh, Remy probably has thoughts on this as well, is um, saying you're from the government, you're here to help is 
oftentimes not appreciated. Keeping with the government side of things, um, you know, citation needed. I might get the statistics a little bit flubbed. Bear with me. But uh, if you go to OMB and you can look at the composition of the federal workforce, uh, for every one employee as of 2018, I believe, for every one employee under the age of 30, there are seven over the age of 60. So thinking about how there's critical infrastructure to be maintained and how much of our nation's economy, as we saw earlier, uh, depends on open source software and the infrastructure of software nowadays and increasingly so every day, uh, that talent challenge is a challenge, but it's also an opportunity. So, you know, when I look at programs like the Digital Core and Coding It Forward and the LFX community and, you know, a lot of these early career talent pipelines, you know, I think that is a, a unique challenge that the public sector has a place to really make a difference and, you know, we have a responsibility to help to secure the supply chain and an opportunity to work with the folks in this room, academics and private sector, uh, to all help to, you know, shore up that supply chain. And I think everyone's thinking a lot about the supply chain these days, so I won't harp on it too much, but uh, the talent, like software is made of bits, it is, but communities are made of people. So how do we gather people together, help share best practices, commoditize as much of the stack as possible so that we can focus our limited time and resources into innovation that actually solves the problems and we're not reinventing the wheel and wasting time and resources. And from a utility perspective, reinventing the wheel is kind of a reflex since we exist. RTE exists since the year 2000. And at the beginning, we were uh, separated from EDF, which was uh, integrated uh, uh, power supplier, transporter, and distributor. And by our own, we were in the jungle with Excel, <laughs> and we did the, all the IT to run this power system through our own, um, our own developments. And when we decided to uh, create this uh, LF energy project, at the time it was something where uh, it was in 2017 and it became a reality in 2018 and uh, 19. Um, we, we changed completely our minds. We decided to uh, say, okay, we now have a lot of digital assets. What about making them public in order the other players of transport system uh, operators to benefit of this Y intercept? they will begin as a, a very positive way intercept. This was the first move we made. And since then, now we have a, a mature uh, open source program office. We have two effects. We can now have the reflex to say, okay, what does exist already in the landscape of energy through open source? So now, each time we decide to make a new digital service, I try to build the reflex of uh, giving this advice to all the project director, project manager, uh, project manager, uh, to, to, to have this, this, this reflex. And it brings also the inner source reflex. We didn't have that. The inner source reflex, for those who don't know what is inner source about, is being inspired by the open source reflex, so to document, uh, to have a clear roadmap, to have a small step to engage in the community. We do it internally. So we have a catalog of solution and we have the documentation. We have a small starter kit and you can try and not buy, but adopt. Uh, and the inner source effect of the OSPO in the utility was unbelievable. And now we have a huge uh, optimization of our ICT cost thanks to, thanks to the open source. And we have the uh, sorry, thanks to the inner source. And we have the open source, the inner source, thanks to the open source. I hope I was clear, <laughs> sorry. So from a university perspective, uh, there are some peculiar challenges. I'll, I'll use that word. Uh, and I mean that affectionately. Um, it, so th there's there's this OSPO maturity model that the To-Do group uh, talks about a great deal, sort of going from adoption to engagement to community to leadership. Uh, and that's a great way of thinking about sort of a journey of, of any open source project. Uh, universities are full of some of the smartest people in the world who don't necessarily know that open source journey at all, right? And, and they're used to publishing a paper that gets cited and it has a transformative effect in their community. And they think, oh, I've put my code on GitHub. 
now I will have that transformative effect, right? Why is this not happening? I don't understand. This must be your fault. Some someone give me another software developer, and it will be solved. And I'm I'm being facetious, but I'm it's not that far from the truth. So this one project I just mentioned, and I want to just make sure I get the right names. Called Tomawa, is the optimization engine for this tool, and it's on GitHub. Uh, and when I first met them, the new executive director had been hired. I said, "What's the license?" And he stared at me. <laughs> And he went, do we need a license on that? I went, yes, you do. Uh, and the, it's not just a license. It's the definition of open source, all those attributes, and so on. So we, we have this sort of peculiar circumstance where people are actually interested and committed to, to producing and using open source, but they don't understand that maturity curve. And they don't necessarily know how to move up that curve with people outside of their project team. Right? You, you can't ask your graduate students to do all of those things that I just described. And graduate students didn't come to school to become maintainers, and, and so on. So it, it's, it's a challenge in that sense, and the, the culture is very different. There, is, there are very few rules. Um, it's not a private sector organization where you have other mechanisms <laughs> to motivate and, and align people's work. Uh, and then we have to do it over and over again. Right, so we're doing this with this one particular project, and that's great. That doesn't necessarily mean it's happening throughout the rest of CMU. So we have to sort of constantly do this bottom-up kind of capacity building and awareness building, and then go to the senior administrators and tell them, we need your help to make this system wide. But they can't tell the faculty it has to be done, and we have to rely on the usual kinds of places where publishing or getting a grant uh, or getting a patent or getting a commercialization opportunity are the incentives. Communicating effectively uh, to infuse open source culture is a concept I've heard in this conversation by a few of you, um, which takes me to the next question that is, um, since OSPOs are there to uh, work with different teams, with different departments, how are, uh, in, in your sectors, collaborating uh, and addressing security issues, uh, collaborating with compliance teams? Um, how, how are you approaching these challenges? Sure. So I feel really lucky that I get to be part of a very large organization. Uh, the federal government question mark is the largest employer in the country question mark. Uh, so citation needed, I'm pretty sure that's a, that's a legit uh, stat. So there are entire departments like Homeland Security and CISA and Science Foundation and a whole bunch of other places that are really dedicated to the different aspects of identifying policy opportunities, incentivizing people, building commercial platforms and public-private partnerships. And I'm really lucky. I just get to be in like the corner that is focused a lot on public health. So you know, when we're working, even within that context, uh, federal <laughs> means federated. So there are just, at every layer, there are people who are concerned with compliance or business or security. So part of what the OSPO does when we think about open source is not this monolith, right? It's a community of communities. So in the center of the Venn diagram is CMS, but we are part of the Department of Health and Human Services, which is itself part of the federal government, which is itself part of the open source community. So a lot like when you're taking your dependencies and you're trying to get them to align with each other in a software project, or when you're trying to write a paper and you want all your citations to make sense with each other, figuring out how to line up all of those various policies at the executive level, the legislative level, the guidance level, the sub-regulatory level, like getting all of those to be in harmony with each other is uh, something I, I really enjoy. And I have a very well-bounded and well-established framework of policies and programs that I can draw from and say, well, the national security, cybersecurity policy says that blah, and within that the Software open source software security roadmap from CISA says that item number 3.2 in their objective pertains to providing open source program office guidance to other federal agencies. And I can go and just pick that right off the tree. Just like if I wanted to pip install something in Python, I could go to the repository and install it. So, you know, I think a lot about 
building programs the same way, capital P programs, the same way I think about building lowercase p programs. There are a lot of dependencies, and we can bring them all together in a way that they harmoniously work, and it's all about how to keep them in line with each other. So that's the approach that we're taking the OSPO. It's very unique. Um, I've been in smaller organizations and startups and you know other places where we don't have those kinds of resources and we don't have those establishments. So being a good partner, helping to elevate and amplify the impact of the people around you, those are really important ways that the OSPO operates because we can't do it all alone. There's just too much, it's too big. So we need all the help we can get. From a utility perspective, it changed a lot of things from a cultural point of view, this jump into the um, open source and the OSPO management. Uh, for example, for the partnership, we were used to have MOUs, we, are, we were used to have NDAs, and we were in the secret making our own, own things. Now, with the open R&D approach, with the open source approach, we have the first reflex to say, hey, we are all here for the same goal. And this goal is global, it's about the energy transition. So let's do it by the best way we can, the open source way. And it changed a lot of things. And concerning the young uh, engineer and, 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 and software developers we have, they are perfectly uh, waiting for that. So it has a, a very great echo to this workforce in ICT department and R&D. So it was the partnership side. And there is also the procurement side. Uh, we were used to uh, have uh, difficult closed IP uh, in the contract, and 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 sometimes you have to get the lower the lawyer, sorry, uh, at the first time you sign the contract, and then maybe a few years after you go back to the lawyer and you have a huge conflict. Now through the open source, it's really easier to have uh, a, a, re a relationship even in a, a procurement. Uh, with with the open source because there is no so many uh, IP challenge, there is no patent uh, target for us or for the supplier. We share the, um, the the benefit of the code because he will become a pure player of this new digital service he developed with RT maybe, but every every other clients of this guy will be able to 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 get it. So there is also um, a point about. Um, have um, no, I, I will bring back. I have to okay. remind what I was to say. Um, I, I I wanted to. There was something that um, Boris, you talked about when with your kind of inner source model of having uh, these kind of um, uh, uh, SDKs almost right. This is a, like starter kit of a project. Um, the way that I've been trying to get the Department of Homeland Security to. Um, do better with their open source adoption, and I'm talking mostly about the consumption, not necessarily the publication, although I'm working that as well, is uh, uh, providing something kind of like that where it's it, it's the uh, the old, uh, what is it, Staples commercial, the easy button, right? Um, so uh, uh, within the Chief Technology Officer Directorate, which is where I sit in, in the headquarters of DHS, um, we have a platform that provides some Enterprise tooling, right? Jira and Confluence, you get the idea. We also have GitLab. But one, um, one of the things that we're trying to do is expand into other tools that can actually act as, a, uh, maybe not exactly turnkey, but start to get to that point where uh, a, a new or even an existing program office that is running uh, a complicated IT system can say, oh, we want to make sure we're in consuming open source properly. And they can, maybe not with one button, but with a single configuration file do proper lifecycle management of that open source, uh, check it for proper licenses, check it for uh, known vulnerabilities, um, do that on a consistent regular basis, do that on merge requests so that those merge requests are blocked if you try and pull in a version of a of a open source library that you know is 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 vulnerable. So, um, and, and then the communication piece of that, of course you, you, you put that out there, uh, you're talking about this, you put that out there and like, no one's gonna do anything with it, right? It's the same as the academic model, no one's gonna do anything with it at the Department of Homeland Security. You might think that we're very tight knit, but we're not. We're two hundred sixty thousand some odd people, right? Uh, and and uh, what was the number that you said? Oh, one hundred seventy six million programs. Like DHS has a large chunk of that. We are the largest civilian federal agency. Uh, DoD is larger than us, but again, not civilian. Um, and so because of that, we have to communicate outwards. So we have um, a, a DevOps a community of practice where we go and we espouse these things. We have an agile community of practice where we go and espouse these things. We have an AI community of practice where we go and espouse these things. 
what we don't have and what we need is probably an open source community of practice that we can go out and espouse these things and that will be the role of the DHS open source program office when it happens. So you, you mentioned the word compliance in your question. Uh, and it's important to point out that people in the university have very different reactions to that word depending on your role, right? So administrators are perfectly fine with the conversation around compliance. And I have lots of conversations with university administrators who fundamentally are concerned about risk management, right? I mean, they do a lot, but that is probably one of the core responsibilities. Faculty have a very different reaction <laughs> if you say, let's talk about compliance. Uh, not, not a good one. So it, it has to be a very different kind of conversation. And the, the concept I fall back on a lot is something from my own educational background in information science is so-called curation thresholds, right? And what they describe are, these are thresholds where people will sort of change their typical way of working or their typical sense of incentives because they have a goal they're trying to accomplish. And so getting a publication done or a grant application done are examples of those thresholds or getting a project like this, you know, tomorrow out to the community is a curation threshold. That's the time when you can sit down with a faculty member and say, I know you have academic freedom, I know you like to work a certain way, and you have a certain lab and a certain team, but you have to adjust that if you want to get past this threshold. And that that's where the OSPO can step in and say, here are some things you can do to make this more seamless, to lower that lift, to let somebody actually engage with what you're doing. Uh, and the hope is that as they do that on the publication side, they'll think about it more on the consumption side, right? Because we have far less control on the consumption side. That's where academic freedom is incredibly important. If I were to tell a faculty member just after they have a grant, you should do this or you should think about that. And I say this as someone who's gotten many grants myself. I don't want people asking me those questions. I'm, I'm trying to get the grant spun up, right? And do the generative creative work on that side. But if those lessons are there in those threshold moments, then maybe it'll come back uh, when they think about, oh, I'm acquiring the software, or I should be thinking about security early on. And then the final thing I'll say is we also have to think about the different kinds of incentives that people have with the university. Sometimes it's teaching better, sometimes it's better research, and so on. So the P4 framework that you heard about, Scott Hissom keeps saying to me, you know, can you help me put a research agenda together? around what are the right measures, what are the right signals to look at. So that's, that will engage a lot of faculty members in a way that conversations on compliance simply wouldn't. So the, the, the point was the public procurement, uh, because we are a public company, a public utility, by this open source way, we optimize the cost of the energy transition. So it's an important cultural thing uh, to, to, to share. And there is also another thing that uh, Cesar said just before. Um, we now Cyber uh, design the code by default. When we begin the project, thanks to the LF Energy, we try to reach the batch to go to the next stage of our maturity for this digital service. So we ask to all the developers to respect exactly what we need from uh, clean design uh, of the code modularity, tests, and CI/CD, and of course, cyber secured by design with the SBOM, etc. So we got nice reflex uh, for the future, uh, thanks to the OSPO uh, changing culture. Mm -hmm. And um, deep in dive into the many challenges, uh, one that I have heard a lot is how to bridge the gap between uh, the subject open source subject matter experts and the policy makers that doesn't necessarily need to be tech people at all. So I don't know if you have any success story or best practices or, or just a story to share about how, how in your sector you're addressing this. Any thoughts? Um, so in 2018, I was... Uh, drafting the, the first draft of what is now the DoD um, open source software policy. And uh, uh, I, I was in an organization called Defense Digital Service. We were um, a, a group similar to Remy's where we bring private industry technologists into government for tours of duty to help make things better. Um, uh, that office uh, at the time directly reported to the Secretary of Defense. So I had a lot of leeway to be able to talk to whomever I wanted to about pretty much whatever I wanted to. Um, and so I started nagging my boss, the director of 
this organization that we um, are 2009 policy because it wasn't really a policy on open source. It was guidance. I think it was the actual name of it was guidance. It was not a signed policy, which meant it couldn't actually do anything, couldn't make anyone, compel anyone to do anything. I said, we we need a policy. We need a, a better policy. And he said, sure, you know, run with it. And it's like, o okay, I don't know what that means. Um, so I, I, I wrote up a draft of something. And then a week later, he was like, great, uh, uh, let's get a meeting with the CIO. And just to be clear again, the DOD CIO, uh, CIO of an organization of 2.3 million people, right? I mean, that's that's a weird thing. And um, I, I went in, this guy, he's a smart guy, but he doesn't really know open source at all in any way, shape, or form. And so uh, I, I think the point here isn't that, hey, look, I had a big meeting. The point here is you have to have people that understand how to explain technology concepts in plain language to non-technical people, the policymakers. I had to have the CIO sign this document. No one else is going to. By the way, it took him five years to sign it. Different CIO, obviously. Um, but it took him five years to sign it out. But the, 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 the ability to get in front of that person and explain in plain language so that he understood, which then he said, okay, I'm not going to sign your policy today, but like, let's talk about the steps to get this because I think there's some precursors. And he was absolutely right, and we got there. But you have to explain that in plain language. You can't try and be a, a techie with the policymakers. And you have to have the people on your staff that aren't the the – hardcore nerds that are not going to be able to talk to a normal person, right? You have to have the people that can bridge that gap. I, I'm going to say this is common to universities as well, right? This this translation function, if I can call it that, is, is essential, right? Uh, the, the, there are many people in universities who are charged with making institutional policies and then coordinating with a larger policy structure who don't have a technology background, right? And they're looking for help. Um, and, and, you know, to be quite frank, they're, they're earnest about it. I, I don't run into people claiming to know about open source software and then saying, let's talk about how we build policy around this. They're actually looking for a lot of help. And that is a key role for an OSPO, right? They, they will hear a thousand different things if they start asking people in the university to advise them about open source. And maybe the OSPO ends up talking to those thousand people. That's fine. But it can become that conduit to have that kind of translation function. And one of the success we had um, in uh, in France was we built the OSPO of RTE in 2019. In 2020, in parallel, we didn't know each other at this time, but the French government decided to build this own OSPO. So the regulation has its own OSPO. And then, at a European scale, the OSPO came. So. I don't remember if the first was European, I think, in 2020, and then Paris, uh, sorry, French government in 2021, I think it was like that. But this is a huge, a huge move. And I think that we are not completely uh, stranger to that. I don't say that we, we triggered this, but I think we, there is something happening on Earth about uh, going to the open source way. So this is a, a huge testimony. And another one is to succeed in the LF Energy project, of course. All right, so I think uh, before moving into Q&As that maybe some of our attendees might have, um, I just wanted to, to ask if um, you have any, any takeaways from, from this panel that uh, you would like to share? Who wants to start? D so one term I've used in the past for an OSPO, at least in the university context, is it's an organizational API. Um, so. Universities are incredibly complex places. <laughs> um, and I hear repeatedly, whether it's a government agency or a private sector company or, or even a donor, uh, I, I find these things so opaque and impenetrable. I don't know who to talk to, and I talk to a few people and I get three different answers from two different people. So I, I, the OSPO can end up becoming a place where if you're curious about what's happening with open source within a university or how it's managed, what its policy structure is, or you know, where to go for particular sectors and projects and so on. The OSPOs are becoming these kind of entities that mask that complexity behind that interface and allow you to engage you know, more readily and easily. Uh, find the passionate, talented people and hold on to them with everything you've got. Yeah. Um, we know the stakes, 
right? We've been talking about the stakes, whether it's you know in the energy sector or in the private sector or in the public sector. Um, these are some of the hardest problems to solve, and uh, we need all of the help we can get. So continue to speak with community organizations and foundations like LF. There are groups like To Do Group and OSPO Plus Plus and other places where if you're interested in OSPOs, uh, there is a wide variety of resources on the internet that you can get involved in. And if in your travels you meet anyone who is interested in joining the public sector, I want to give a quick shout out for the U.S. Digital Corps. That's digitalcore.gsa.gov. They do two-year tour of duty. Coding It Forward, which is putting public sector technologists into internships, and uh, the usdigitalresponse.org, which is where if you don't fall into one of those early career talent buckets, uh, you can volunteer your time as a private individual. And um, of course, you know, LF has internship programs as well in the LFX community. Uh, really, you know, if we're going to unite hackers on planet Earth to solve these hard problems for everyone, uh, we're gonna need all the help we can get. So thank you all for being here and thank you for having us. And for me, uh, my, my takeaway will go to the vendor. And why? Because uh, Cesar has said that this adventure is uh, both a public and private thing. And uh, I remember, surely, uh, I met her the first time in Paris. Uh, it was an event organized by RT. The name of the meeting is uh, Network Together. Clever. Uh, Network Together, we invite our suppliers and we present our roadmaps in order them to be ready to answer to our needs in the time. For example, for commanding new power lines, etc. So they have to schedule what they have to produce. So during this meeting, I met Julie and she told me, you know, Boris, we will succeed in this, uh, in this journey if vendors jump into. So I am the official sponsor of Trolley in LFE and I really would like to thank Maizo and, and G. Vanova for what they are doing about Trolley. It's unbelievable. They are completely changing the game and they, deci they decide to jump first. So this achievement, this milestone is now there. So if it was a condition of success we're, we're at. So thank you so much for that and I hope others will join. Awesome, thank you so much for your words. So we have a few minutes for questions. So any questions from the audience? Yeah, okay. Um, how are we, so like go, okay, okay. Oh, okay. Uh, Thank you very much for for the panel. I I have a question for for Sajid and, and probably Boris as well. So, how can you change or influence the the university production of open source through procurement? And probably while also for for, for Jordan and, and Remy as well, if when you are hiring someone, doesn't matter who. How can you influence that uh, someone to produce quality open source? Yeah, so I, I think it has to be aligned, and this is probably true of everyone up here, with the mission of, of the organization, right? And so the case that we've made repeatedly at Carnegie Mellon is you don't have to think of open source as an end. It, it's a means, right? And it's a means to do a lot of the things that you know Remy just very eloquently said, but it's also a way to do better research. It's a way to do better education. It, it's a way to do community engagement in a way that universities typically don't. It's a way for students to feel more included and plugged in to what's happening in the institution. So we don't really show up and basically say, you must do open source. We ask the questions, what are you trying to do with your research? What are you trying to do with the teaching? Here's how open source can make that better. Uh, and I, uh, honestly, I'm, I'm not finding that a very hard conversation to have. The more difficult conversations are about that's not actually how open source works. <laughs> or, or if you want to be more effective in working in the open source community, you might want to think about the following things. But it, it's fundamentally just how does open source as an amplifier of what's already happening or what they're interested in getting done. And to answer from the RT point of view, it's very natural. Maybe it's a surprise for you, but why am I saying that? Because students don't want to be maintainers. 
but they are looking for a job. And when they are looking for a job, a, they learn that we are doing the energy transition through open source. They are completely seduced by that, and they're awaiting the employer to offer them this open source ecosystem they studied on. So they begin the journey in the academic sector, and then they come to an employer, and then they will become maybe a uh, director for an intern quickly, and then this intern will be in the academy, and the OSPO will, co will, have, been, will have coached this new guy, so the turnover will have a nice effect for producing cyber security design software, clean code, documented code, tested code, and, and, and this kind of changing of the culture will spread into the uh, academic. So it will take time, but it will be very natural. And, um, and I think we can al already measure this kind of effects because when we have higher, uh, um, I don't know how to say, higher uh, meetings, uh, we have candidates uh, and, and, and we say, we, uh, we, uh, we engage in open source. They are very seduced because they come and their reputation is, is not depending on us. They will depend on them and it will be available on GitHub. So when they bootstrap at RT, hopefully they will stay, but they will be free to develop their own reputation. And the cage is open and they stay. So we are very happy about that. And I think it's a, a great cycle. The, uh, what Boris is just talking about is really important, but I think that what I want to hammer on is, is to your question, you don't hire people that are that are a hundred percent clued in to open source and change the organization. You change the organization and hire people in and they will naturally be in that environment. If you don't change the organization you have now, hiring new people in won't work because they'll just get frustrated and leave. So you have to set up that culture and then hire people in. And guess what? I don't care if they have any open source experience. I don't care if they understand the open source workflow at all. Because guess what? That's what the culture does. That's what the, when you hire a technologist into the U.S. federal government, you poison them with all of the horrible things that we do, and they become what you are trying to change. I am trying desperately to change that. And people like Olga and Remy and, and, and in fact, like all of CISA are, are trying to, to do that, to change that culture. CISA has an open source by default policy. If you go to the CISA GitHub organization, you will see quite a number of repositories. Some of them are in production states, some of them aren't, and that's fine. They're, they're, they're working uh, products, but you have to have that culture and then hire the people into it. It doesn't work the other way around. And you know, we have a very large ratio of contractors to full-time employees of something like eight or nine to one. So when we talk about procurement, um, I think it's a really great question. Luckily, you know, I'm not a lawyer or an expert, but we have lawyers and experts who write our procurement policies and we also inherit from like FAR and Tech FAR and a few of these other federal regulations that talk about what we should be doing with contractor accountability and ways that contractors can deliver and ways that the agency can evaluate uh, pitches and businesses from contractors. And then in our OSPO, we can help to guide people, right? Like we have maturity models now, we have repository templates now, we have CI jobs now. They're based on tools that are maintained by the open source community, right? like Repo Linter from the to-do group and other private sector places. And that gives people guardrails, it gives them training wheels, it gives them examples and reference implementations so that we make it easy for contractors to comply with those things and build open source by default. And 10 or 15 years ago, that number that Synopsys was doing, right, the pr proportion of open source software that exists in all of the software was lower, but today it's in the high 90s, right? Contractors want to be developing open source software. It's not that much of a culture shift. The private sector is used to delivering things these way. So we can make it easier for people to comply and do things the way that the private sector often are and change that culture from within, like, like our good friend Jordan was saying over here. So great question. Okay, uh, I've been thinking a lot about <clears throat> uh, maintenance, right? And that, that becoming a maintainer of something is what takes it from being a toy to something that is like, you know, you see those pictures where like, this is the, ro the, the, the rock that the world depends on. Um, 
maintenance is is uh, uh, tricky and. I'm curious, especially if you look at, you know, a government organization or RTE, um, you want to contribute back maintenance, but you also, you have a job to run. None, none of you are trying to turn into Red Hat. So uh, do you see that the OSPO is being involved in creating the business cases and the operating models for the right level of contribution back to the community? Um. I'll share a very small success story that I think highlights something. That was, this is very recent, uh, last week or the week before. Um, I have a, a program that I advise on that is real bad at open source, um, hasn't updated their dependencies in about four years. It's totally fine. Uh, in going through the evaluation of one of these products, they realized that um, the XML parsing library they were using wasn't doing any kind of validation on the XML input. It wasn't meant to. It never intended to do that. It doesn't say that it does that. And this was a problem for us. And one of the contractors of his own volition submitted a GitHub issue that said, hey, th this is a problem. Could you add validation? The maintainer said, well, that's going to add a lot of overhead. What if we make it optional? The contractor said, yeah, that sounds good. And a month later, there's a commit and a release pending that contains this thing. And, and I think the point here is that an OSPO should help you to define what those interactions can be and should look like. Because what I don't want is that contractor spending government dollars to make that fix when it wasn't actually necessary for us necessarily? Like we don't, we don't really need that. We have other mechanisms that we can do. I don't want to pay the contractor to do that work um, under this particular contract. Uh, but that sort of engagement is very easy, and I think you have to define those levels of engagements um, and and what what good looks like. I also don't want them going off and doing that on random other repos on the government dollar. In that case, it was highly relevant to what we were doing. That's, I think, the kind of things that the OSPO can create a framework for, is what those small engagements can look like. And then beyond that, if we're going to publish something open source, what does it look like to accept contributions? What does it look like? What are good models for that? To answer to your question, um, is I have to, to say something. In RTE, we decide a, a crazy bet <laughs> but it, we succeed. We decided to put the most critical piece of software for our company in open source. By that I mean the control room center software. By that I mean the substation virtualization system, etc. So uh, we decided to hire internally in the ICT team and in the R&D team the best developer as we can. And uh, from N or NREL, you said that I, I can remember that it was complex to have electro technician and IT guys. We hired 100 of them. So internally, we have guys that are perfectly ready uh, and, and, and they really would like more to do that, is to, of course, build their own open source assets, put it uh, worldwide available, have a huge adoption. They are very proud when there is adoption, but they are also really proud to contribute to piece of upstream uh, we have in this code. They are very proud to give a feedback to the open source. So the culture has changed you know, during this last five years, and we are not consuming, and even if we are not a professional of software, we are not Red Hat, as you said, but we are uh, completely um, okay with dedicating time to the open source for our uh, own assets, but other asset and sometimes of course when when we rely on this asset so it's 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 uh it's in our dna now does it answer your question i'm not sure mm, partially but no okay <laughs> go ahead Bernie. we can continue after so. time is up i just want to give a shout out to say that dhs has in writing in a policy that says that contributing upstream is something that employees in the government should do and that opens the door for people to do maintenance. And self-selection is the engine, so your project is not guaranteed to be the thing that everyone uses unless it's solving a real-world problem. And we build communities where uh, you can control the conditions, right? Like a greenhouse. There's no guarantee that a seed will sprout, but if you have the right temperature and the right moisture and the right environment, there's a better chance that your community will grow. And it's even better if you're surrounded by other organisms and gardeners who are all in the same boat in the same climate so f community i think is the the big answer to that but big shout out to dhs with their update recently it opens the door to being part of that maintainer uh, helping to address the maintainer and sustainability issues we've been talking about 
And well, thank you for our amazing panelists for this insightful uh, discussion. And please give uh, a big applause to them. And um, yeah, thank you.